So this morning we have been singing Christmas carols. There's a history to Christmas carols. We're not going to get into the history of that, but singing and Christmas seem to go together. In fact, music and Christmas go together. And we've heard the Christmas music, some of it, you know, <laughs> some of that Christmas music we've seen in the advertisements since September. But certainly since Thanksgiving and, the, and entering the Advent season, we have been singing Christmas songs and hearing Christmas songs. In fact, no season, no event has music written for it like the Christ event. That includes Easter. The sheer number of songs. If you go out into some of the websites, just sheer number of Christmas songs and Christmas carols that have been written in the past three, four, five centuries uh, dwarfs any other event that we can think of. There's something about the birth of this baby. The baby is an hours old and outside of town, not too far from where that little feeding trough is that is holding the baby, are some shepherds on a hillside. And these shepherds get a visit visit from angels, a visit from heaven itself. It says, after this whole thing is over, they go back to heaven. They are coming from heaven itself, a place we can't see. But this event, this birth is no, is it a few hours old, and these angels are singing. <laughs> They're singing. So this birth has always been associated with carols and songs in a way that no other birth has been associated with it. You see, this baby is no ordinary baby. This baby is the heir to David's throne. This baby is the one who has been promised throughout all the Old Testament. For 2,000 years, Israel had been waiting. Waiting. So when that baby shows up, it's occasion for singing, music. The heir to David's throne is in that feeding trough, and that's good news because it's this baby who is going to save his people from their sins. He is going to give them forgiveness. He's going to give them life, and that is good news. And Luke records the words of their song. In fact, from what we know about the way these are written in the text, more than likely the early church to whom Luke is writing is probably singing this song. And these are the words. Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace to people he loves. Peace on earth to people he loves. You can begin to hear even going back all the way to creation. Glory to God in heaven. Peace to people on earth. Heaven and earth. All of reality, the entire universe, has a stake in that baby lying in that feeding trough. Heaven and earth. Everything we know, the entire universe, all of our existence, has to know that what is happening in that manger is for us, is for you, is for me. Glory to God and peace to people. Glory to God and peace to people. That hasn't happened since the garden, the garden of Eden. God's always going to get the glory. There's always occasion for giving God glory. But there hasn't been peace to people. No. You see, what happened in the garden, that relationship was fractured. Man went to war with God and vice versa. <laughs> It hasn't been peace. Now there is. That baby lying in that feeding trough. 
glory to God and peace to people. That is good news. You see, give glory to God because that child in the manger is bringing peace. He is peace. And then it, there's that phrase at the end, peace to people that he favors. Peace to people that he favors. This is God's grace laying in the manger. We don't deserve that. We don't deserve that baby in the feeding trough. Peace to people he favors. Those on whom he has bestowed grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And who are those people? I mean, that's an, that's an interesting question. Who are the people that he favors? You know, Luke answers that question. If we start to read Luke 3 and then Luke 4 and Luke 5, and we start making our way through this, this story that Luke is chronicling for us, we find that the people that he favors are sinners. The outcasts. The rebels. Those who don't deserve it. He says, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. I have come. And Luke's already told us by that point what is how he came. This one in the, this one in the manger, this one in the cloth, has come for those who were lost. Peace to people that God favors. Sinners. You see, that's us. The, the angels are singing about Jesus. They're singing about us. Us. The good news is that this baby in an unsanitary feeding trough, has come to rescue us. Rescue you and rescue me from darkness, from sin, from death, from evil. He has come to forgive us our sin and to bring us that peace to make us right with God again like it was in the garden. 33 years later, this baby will die, he will rise, and he will give us life. No strings attached. So this Christmas, whatever song we're singing, <laughs> even if it's Rudolph, Hoel's favorite. Whatever song we are singing, let us remember that all of the music, all of the music, at its kernel, at its, as its source, in this season, in some point, in some way, is going to intersect with this thought. Glory to God in the highest and peace to people on earth whom God favors. That's our song. That's the song of the season. That's the Christmas carol, the first Christmas carol about Jesus for us, for me, for you. And that's what compels us to sing at Christmas time.